First, I would like to open up with a video. Yeah, I'd like to open up a video from, like I said earlier, Silicon Valley that I think is the perfection of um, what all this recognition stuff really is about, to be honest. Oh. Great. Thank you. Nice work. What's in that? Uh, that is a for the desk. Good to know. Let him have it. Joe Paul thought he was too good to work on seafood, and now he's my new fortune. Okay. Ready for test? Have you human lady? Oh, this is weird. Me and just to make good luck with the demo. Did any of you guys tell her about this? Your hyper girlfriend wouldn't happen to know the model of our router, would she? Yeah, actually, she complimented your choice. Why did you say anything? Why would I tell you she said something nice about you? Damn it. You have to assume she's everywhere. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, God. What would you say if I told you there's an app on the mile past that part? Just demo it. Okay. <laughs> Let's start with a photo. Oh. <laughs> Jinyan, my beautiful little oceanic friend, I'm going to buy you the palapa of your life. We will have 12 posts, braided palm leaves. You'll never feel exposed again. I'm going to be rich. Pizza, Mr. Pizza. Yeah. Pizza. <laughs> that's, that's it? It only does hot dogs? <laughs> no, and it's not hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> you gave me the ability to spin gold. Alright, we're going to stop it there. I feel like that pretty much does it. Um, that is basically the current state of most facial recognition, machine learning. I mean, like, I do this stuff for a living, and, you know, it's, like, really cool, it's really amazing, but I always tell people it's worse than you really think it is. So, but, um, and, you know, the video is great because as we go through the presentation, you'll see why that happened and how they could have solved it with, you know, fairly easy, um, fairly easy stuff. So this part, this talk is in, is part of a presentation I'm doing for Code Blue um, next month. So you're more than welcome to talk, to come out there and, and see me talk. I will be doing like a very long presentation, actually how to hands-on build a lot of these things. But so the basic agenda is we're going to talk about me, which is my favorite topic. Um, <laughs> we're going to talk about some five truths of data science as I know them. We're going to uh, describe the problem, what we're going to try to solve with this code and uh, this presentation tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about some dependencies, tools I use, things you can find online. We're going to do a hands-on demo. All of the demo we're going to do here is open source code. Uh, at first, I try to use like a lot of proprietary stuff, but then I realized, ain't nobody got time for that. And plus, you know, nobody got money for that. Uh, so everything, we, everything you're going to we do tonight, you can do on your computer with things you can download completely for free with your webcam. If you have the better quality camera, the, you know, all that stuff is great. You can tweak it a little bit, it's great. You can run it on a Raspberry Pi, it's great. But you should be able to run all of this on your computer. Uh, and the code is, I'm going to post a link. This is all on GitHub right now. I posted it before I came here. So I'll post a link on the Meetup group website. Um, so that way you can access the exact same uh, Jupyter notebook I used for this presentation of all the code and everything else. Only thing it will not have is um, all of the pictures. Uh, that's it. But everything else, you know, you can create those folders and upload pictures. <clears throat> so that's me. You'll see this picture again. Um, this is what I look like on the internet. This is what I look like in real life. Uh, this was uh, this was taken like uh, when I was training for the Derby Marathon in the spring. It was a lot of fun. Uh, so, a uh, basic bio about myself, um, I, I work with data to help the Army's medical department solve issues. Uh, a lot of it relates around our marketing spend, our not really patient outcome stuff so much, but marketing spend, operations, how to increase operations, how to um, 
how to make us more efficient, how to spend money more efficiently, and how to retain our doctors more efficiently, and how to just run our operations more efficiently because we're, we are a global national organization, so we have facilities all over the world, we have doctors all over the world, we have people all over the world, so a lot of it, we have to find the efficiencies. Before that, I used to do combat uh, infantry type reconnaissance. Uh, it's not as cool as it sounds. A lot of it involves sitting in a dark hole or a dark building for days and hours on end, watching empty roads, and for five minutes something happens, you're like, ooh, something happened. Um, you call it on the radio, and then you're there for another five days watching nothing. So <laughs> I, I was basically a walking camera at that point. You know, it's a longer battery life. Um, I deployed to Afghanistan, Iraq, you know, typical stuff. Uh, Republic of Georgia over in uh, by Russia. Um, lived in Germany for a while, and then I, you know, I had a chance to really see how the military uses facial recognition, data analysis, on like a really first-hand national security level, um, from some of the cameras I placed overlooking roads to uh, using data to track down different networks and things like that. So current role, I work as a data scientist. Um, tech, my actual title within the Army, because we don't have data scientists in the Army, my actual title is called Future Operations. Uh, I like to lovingly refer to as Foo Ops. That always gets, <laughs> yes. It's, I don't know why people find that so funny. I really don't. I love it. I think the name is great. Um, programming languages I work with, don't not be impressed by this. I am nowhere the proficiency that most of you are. I can hack my way through these different languages, mostly because I have to use a lot of them uh, for work. I say most data scientists are the ultimate generalist. You know, we have to kind of be a jack of all trades, master of none. Have to know almost all the programming languages, how to use them, but don't really have to go super in depth in any of them because we're not building full scale applications. Um, some of the tools I use on a regular basis for data, SQL. I mean, a lot of it really is SQL. Everybody's pounding on SQL, but I still find that it's literally the thing, the database I use the most. Uh, I use AWS, Azure, typical cloud things we'll kind of cover here a little bit more. So on my education, I'm going to U of L for some data science, data science masters. <clears throat> I did a little bit of cybersecurity stuff, um, a graduate certificate out of DC. I actually, non-traditional computer guy, I started off in accounting, crunching numbers, doing taxes horribly, and I realized that, you know, <laughs> I wasn't maximizing my returns, so I kind of left, I stopped doing that. Interest about me, I like food, I love food, um, I really love food, really. And by the way, this meetup is the best food meetup in the city, <laughs> hands down, hands down. I've been to a lot of meetups, you're lucky if you get some Papa John's pizza and a bottle of water thrown at you as you walk in, so this is solid. Uh, I enjoy doing startups, you know, just being around startups. I have three kids uh, back there. Um, I belong to a group for Num Focus, which is the people that make pandas, SciPy, NumPy, all those different things. I'm on the diversity, diversity and inclusion work group. We're working to get more uh, diverse representation within Python and within the scientific. Uh, contact information, you can find me on LinkedIn, you can find me on GitHub. I don't do Twitter. I keep wanting to do Twitter, but I don't like it. I just don't like it. So um, we're moving on from that. So these are the five truths of data science as I know them. Uh, they could be different from what you are doing or what you might agree with me on, but as I see, this is what it is. One, humans are more important than data. Why? Because it takes humans to actually interpret and make decisions about the data. Uh, Quantity is better than quality. This was a change from when I originally started. I used to think that it was all about the quality of the data, but then I was proven horribly wrong. Uh, and this is why, anybody ever heard of the, uh, the law of large numbers? Kind of familiar with it? For those who might not be, because I wasn't for a very long time, those who might not be, the law of large numbers says that the more amount of numbers you have, basically, the more accurate your result. So if I'm trying to find the average of something, if I have a hundred things to compute the average, it's more accurate than having two things to compute the average. So data is much the same way. Quality matters, but the quantity 
is really, really important because it's hard to train a machine model. It's like learning. If you think about a human being, human beings, before we go, before we on our own, right? We have, what, 18 years of knowledge, of trial-based knowledge. And that's a lot, if you think about it in data terms, that is a lot of data. That is a lot of data that we are processing. Some of it, great quality, great experiences, really enriching. Some of it, not so much. Some of it, we just sit in front of our iPhone and play Candy Crush. You know, so quantity is very, very important. But quality matters, though. Let's not forget that. Um, data scientists cannot be mass produced. Data is very hot right now. If I misspelled anything, please forgive me. Jupyter Notebooks is, does not have a spell check. I'm still trying to figure that out. Uh, data scientists cannot be mass produced. So a lot of times, you know, data is the hot topic, right? It's like the new oil, the new gold, the new this, the new that. Uh, so everybody's trying to become a data scientist or, you know, and let's face it, I became a data scientist because I heard it was the new gold. So I was like, oh, that's great. Um, but I, in my experience, I've learned that you really cannot mass produce it for the same reason you can't take a two-year-old and put it in charge of something. Because data science is not just about the algorithms. It goes back to point one, which is humans are more important, which means that as a data scientist, you are tasked to make decisions about the data. You're tasked to ask questions about the data. And if you're not asking the right questions, you're not going to get the right answers. It's just You can't have enough data to, um, to make up the error for a wrong question. And that's where judgment, that's where experience, that's where skill, training, education, all that comes into play. Anybody can code this stuff up. You can go home and code this stuff up. Um, but it really takes the experienced eye to determine what is useful and what is not. What is important and what is not. Uh, dependencies, we're going to... Oh, last thing. <clears throat> Mo, uh, most data science operations require non-data science assistance. What does that mean? That means that a lot of my job involves working with other people and leveraging other people's skills. I code in a lot of, I, I can't say code, I hack my way through a lot of different languages, but at the end of the day, I'm not going to build a production-ready system. What I'm usually tasked with is to prototype something, develop a solution, answer a question, and then work with the software developers to implement that solution at, um, at a production scale that, you know, is redundant and everything else. Mine is some code that works, it works within certain parameters, it, it you know, validates the model, but it's not going to serve a thousand, you know, queries a second. It's just, it's not going to happen. So I have to work with software engineers. I have to work with database administrators because I'm not handling, I'm not managing the data that I'm processing. I have to work with, you know, the business executives to find out what questions should I be asking and what kind of information do you want out of this. Uh, some dependencies we're going to use, Visual Studio, everything in here can be done in Visual Studio Code. I mean, I really prefer Jupyter Notebooks. It's super easy. It's a lot of power. I'm going to do this whole presentation on Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, we'll be using YOLO, which um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the great uh, rapper poet <laughs> called Drake. Um, it's not you only live once, or you, it's you only look once, which is a um, recognition algorithm. I, I think the name is cool. CUDA, which allows us to do parallel processing on GPUs, in case you're wondering why I have such a big laptop, because it's technically a gaming laptop, and I really bought it for the GPU so I could paralyze a lot of things, and CUDA allows you to do that. Uh, versus a CPU where it's serial, and it's like one process, and another process, and another process. Most mathematical operations, to include what we're going to do tonight, benefit from being able to do it all in parallel. Uh, we'll you won't, you won't really use CUDIN, which is really a programming interface for CUDA. It's built in C, C++, which is the only reason I haven't really know C++. Um, OpenCV is also built in C++, uh, but we'll be using a Python API to work with it, so we're not actually going to work with the C++ directly. We'll be talking about AWS recognition. We'll be talking about Azure <coughs> Cognitive Services. And I encourage you to take a look and Google up Shodan. It's a really, if you ever wanted to find out like the surveillance state, the surveillance state is not really the government. The surveillance state is some webcam some guy has in a store that is not secured and that has a web interface where you can log on to it and see everybody that walks into a store and control the camera and freak him out. Um, Shodan will allow you to do that. 
Uh, Python packages used, we talked about pandas for data frames, NumPy for mathematical processing, scikit-learn for a little bit more advanced scientific processing, matplotlib for graphs, seaborn for data visualization, pillow for images, time for time, UID for um, to generate unique file paths. I'm not even sure I really use that one. Uh, math for math operators, sys and OS for actual interacting with the system because we have to use the webcam and keyboard. Keras will, Keras is a high level implementation of TensorFlow. TensorFlow is a machine learning uh, interface. It's really, really powerful. It's open source, well, kind of open source-ish. It's developed by Google, kind of maintained by them, but Keras is a high level uh, API uh, for Python that we use to interact with it. OpenCV, completely open source. Most of the presentation is going to be in OpenCV. You'll learn how to kind of do some basic things and uh, we'll learn how to recognize this Cancuzi, hopefully. We'll show dark, YOLO and then we'll show Darknet, which is really a part of YOLO, does the processing. Okay, let's move along. I'm not going to cover the code too in depth. We'll kind of go over it to show the functionality, but I'm not going to go line by line and talk about this package, that package. We'll just, if you understand Python, you'll be able to read along and kind of, it's fairly simple code. Uh, this is all the imports we're using. It's a lot of them, a lot of imports. Different packages and whatnot. Okay, so we're going to start off with by acknowledging the fact that really this is very advanced technology. If you had, if we had tried to do this 30, 20 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, it would have seemed like magic to us. Like, wow, it's magical that a computer can recognize your face and figure out, is it a hot dog or is it not a hot dog? Like, that would have been absolutely <laughs> magical. Not comical, but magical. Um, so the problem overview is that a lot of us in society now feel that government is doing a lot of overreach, right? The surveillance state, we're being tracked. Um, companies like Facebook, Google, all these companies are soaking up our data and storing it, analyzing it, finding all this information about us. So what we're trying to do here is to show the various tools that could be used or science behind this kind of surveillance state. How are they able to take our image, take our face, and find out who we are? For some people that's scary, for some people it's like, great, I can walk into Starbucks and they'll give me exactly what I want because they recognize me right away. You know, for other people, it's no, they're gonna, they're gonna find me and do all this crazy stuff to me. So these are a couple of examples of facial recognition in the news. Um, the most, two of the most recent things is Department of Homeland Security got us some hot water for accessing DMV photos on a national scale to train machine learning algorithms to recognize your face and also um, for identification. Right? That was a, I don't know if anybody followed it, but it's kind of like, oh, what's going on here? Um, and also, there's, if anybody's been to a passport lately, uh, passport airport lately, there is a move to replace kind of like your passport with a photo, where you can walk up to the counter, they take a photo of you, and then they confirm your identity and say, "Oh yeah, that's you, that's Luther, that's Jim, that's Scott." Um, and then the other thing is, Orlando was recently canceled their contract for Amazon recognition, which is a commercial application of this. Uh, that what Amazon recognition the Orlando City is trying to do is work with the police department to identify criminals. So they have all these cameras all over the city, uh, personal and also government owned, that they can access. So they're working with Amazon to analyze that data and then match the faces and movements against known criminals or databases or missing people or different things. It's really cool they were able to track people, and then you just go online and YouTube it. It's like really cool what they were able to do, and we'll kind of briefly talk about it. But everything Amazon recognition is doing, we're going to learn how to do at a very low scale with very low technology. It's not going to be at a production scale, but it's going to give you an idea of how, you know, how they did it. So first thing, we're going to talk about the science of facial recognition. The science of facial recognition really started in about 2000. The first phase was hard-coded algorithms where uh, before that we had facial recognition, meaning that it was possible to do it, but it was only possible if you actually took one image at a time and hard-coded, like wrote the code to recognize that image. 
what this algorithm, uh, the Viola James algorithm, allowed us to do is use machine learning um, to automatically do that within the video at real time. And they did that by basically, if you look at the picture, classifying and identifying different parts of your face. So they were able to say, okay, this is an eye, this is a nose, this is a mouth. All three of these things combined make a human being. They're able to take measurements of those and say, hey, this is Luther. But they can only do that if they have a picture, a labeled picture of Luther. But they're able to do it in real time. And the algorithm really boils down to a fancy for loop and a fancy if statement. You know, most algorithms are really not that uh, coding intensive. It's more or less about the logic behind how it's done. Uh, so if you look at a couple things you see on here, they want to downsample the image. A lot of times we think that computers are seeing the entire image when they do all this analysis. They're really not. They're looking at a very small portion of the data of the image. So next up, um, histograms arrive. Anybody is from, I had to find this picture of histogram. It's not there's no arrival time thing in the presentation, but it's the most colorful one I could find. And my daughter loved it, so I kept it. Um, <laughs> and if you don't know a histogram, that's a histogram. So think of a uh, histogram. The algorithm was called Hogs, histograms of oriented gradients. If anybody, a gradient is basically a fancy way of saying a vector, and a vector is a fancy way of saying a direction. So what you're doing is you're getting a, a combination of directions and you're putting all that together into a histogram of values and you're plotting it and you're figuring out where the mean is, where, you know, what the 20th percentile is and everything else. Anybody recognize this guy? Will Farrell, right? So let's see how the computer would analyze Will Farrell's face for comedic genius. Um, so the first thing that algorithm does really is it takes that photo and it breaks it down to individual pixels. So pixel by pixel, it will spread it out. Then it will downsample it. Notice that this photo is not in color. I'm sure originally it was a color photo, but it's not in color. Downsampling allows the what we call in data science is dimensionality reduction, meaning taking out unnecessary information that doesn't is not relevant to the analysis. Having a color photo will is not relevant to figuring out who it is that can do it. If a black and white photo, color photo, it doesn't really matter. So they take individual pixels, they figure out what is the darkest pixel, what is the lightest pixel, and then they assign a gradient slash a vector to that pixel. So each pixel is replaced with a gradient or vector saying this is direction, this is the direction of the darkest spot next to the pixel. So if you have a light pixel, the arrow, the gradient arrow will be pointing to the, ne to the next darkest spot. And it'll just keep doing that for the entire photo. So that entire photo is basically replaced into this, right? The entire photo is replaced into a series, series of gradients. Pixel by pixel, it is given a gradient. Now the real fun begins. That individual pixel is then turned into a 16 by 16 square of pixels. And those 16 by 16 squares are averaged out, given a gradient that is an average, or vector that is an average of that 16 by 16 square pointing to the same thing. So it, lighter, darker, lighter, darker, lighter, darker. And then at the end of it all, we get Will Ferrell. Can it, if you looked at this, you could not tell this was Will Ferrell. The computer can't tell it's Will Ferrell, but it couldn't tell it was Will Ferrell with the color photo. So it doesn't really matter. But if you look at it from a computer perspective, it has enough data to really tell that this is Will Ferrell if you knew who Will Ferrell was. Why? You can identify, what can you identify? You can identify the eyes. You can identify the forehead. You can identify the nose. You can identify the lips. You can identify the outline of his face. You can identify the entire shape of his head. Go ahead. Okay, would it depend on the quality of the photo as compared to what is light and what is dark? Yes, and well, not really, and we'll cover that in like the next step, you'll see how the computer doesn't use, once again, doesn't use as much, doesn't need as much data as a human being would. Is this similar to uh, fingerprint uh, analysis and recognition? 
information and you have certain things in the fingerprint there's like 17 or 20 different yeah. key points that they use and they can search a massive database because they can hone in on something pretty quickly. So is that what this is doing pretty much? So this, this part of it is not <clears throat> that, but the matching one face to another is that. Because so with this picture right here, much like a fingerprint, I can run a series of calculations. What is the mean point from eye to eye? What is the longest point on the face? What is the width of the face? And given those data points, those, those numbers, now I can compare that to another face and say, do, do those data points match this other face? If they match this other face, then there might be a high possibility that these two people are the same. So that's what it's effectively doing is, is down sampling to reveal the key features and then those key features are measured, that measurement is compared to other faces and that's how they do the recognition. They don't look at the entire picture per se, they look at key features, key measurements. I'm seeing that you're, made, you're turning this, this amount of data into a simple representation of this person and that lets the computer filter out other people that are not like exactly this. it reduces the unnecessary data that the computer has to work with um, so next we kind of entered all these two solutions are still really very hard coding intensive very as you can tell pixel by pixel the computer has to kind of go over it and somebody has to tell the computer this is what I want you to look for this so I want you to do it so the deep learning era begins in 2012 with convolutional neural networks try saying that five times fast um, and intro, quick intro to machine learning, it's data guided, uh, garbage in, garbage out. You know, like the prediction is only as good as the input that you give it. Um, more, like I said before, more data equals more precision, be, precision because the law of large numbers. The better the average, the better the accuracy. Inputs, inputs in data science are called features, uh, not software features but features right it describes points of data maybe it's a column containing height or a column containing a user id or you know anything else features can increase or decrease accuracy not all features are created equal meaning that if i'm trying to analyze for something i have 10 features maybe only three of them are really necessary to answer the question that i'm asking the other, all the other seven out of that 10 are not really necessary and actually might slow down the process or give me a false, uh, false reading. So feature selection is a very big part of data science because you just can't, you just can't take everything and be like, oh, it's, I'll just take it all. You have to really be selective about it. Uh, large input should be normalized. What does normalization mean? It means that your feature might have different ranges. If I'm looking at salary, that salary might range from zero to a million. But if I'm looking at height, it might range from six to, you know, zero to seven. If I'm looking at the width of a table, it might be, in, you know, from one foot, from zero feet to two feet. And I have to take all of that and figure out how do I run analysis and all of it. Machines can't scale very well individual numbers like that. So what we do is we apply a scaling, a scaling function uh, the one I like to use the most is um, a scalar input. So what you do there is you take all those numbers and you basically make it fit between zero and one. It's kind of like the, you get a ratio, you say, okay, one out of 10, you know, and maybe 10,000 out of a million is assigned to this value as it relates to zero out of one. And then once everything is within scale, you can then run analysis on it. Uh, neural networks, neural networks, if you think of your brain, anybody knows how the brain works? No, neither do I, and I don't know anything about neural networks, and nobody does. Meaning that, uh, it really don't. We know that it works, we know the basic framework and composition of why it works, but you would not be able to trace a solution through a neural network. Much like you can't trace a solution through your brain. Uh, layers that do provide interoperability. Exactly. You can. Well, yeah, you can, you, but, but you, you don't have a complete visibility of, tra of traceability. Typically don't. Exactly. You typically don't. You don't, typically don't have the traceability to go from start to finish and know exactly 
Unless you're talking to, by the way, uh, a lot of those are being brought in requirements for the government, actually. Yes. Neural networks that do have interpretability. So they build special layers just to expose it. Just to expose it. Exactly. Um, so the other thing is that neural networks have the way it works, it works with weights and biases and activation functions. So uh, everything is given a weight. What is the chances that this is equal to that? Um, and actually, we'll see a basic implementation of the neural network calculator, and we'll see that it's pretty correct, but sometimes it's not always correct um, when it works. So this is a basic idea of a neuron, right? We have the inputs could be, a, you know, it doesn't have to be three inputs, it could be five inputs, it could be whatever inputs. Um, the inputs could actually be outputs from a different neuron. So we take our inputs, we feed it into the neuron, the neuron has an activation function, um, there's all different types of activation functions, and they then calculate a probability that something happened, or give, you know, give it a weight that this is what we want to happen. That output is then kicked out, that output can be the final output, or that output could be fed into another neuron, to another calculation, to another output. And you can see how it could get complicated because you know, one neuron might have three different inputs from three different neurons. We then have three different inputs from different, you know, you, you walk that all the way back. It's hard to say this action led to this result without, like you said, getting into the middle of it, where you're basically kind of segmenting your network and saying, okay, at every step of this analysis, I want to see exactly what happened. Uh, so we have, this is what it looks like, right? The hidden layers could be two, could be three, could be a million, could be whatever. Isn't that similar to the way transistors work? Yes. Yeah, I mean, they have uh, input, output, they have the diode that does the, does it meet the criteria or not, zero or one, and then it has an output. So yeah. Um, deep convolutional networks, I'm just gonna breeze through this. So if you think about it this way, on the left is what we would typically see as an X, right? So that X is assigned certain values, and on the right is what a neural network would kind of shrink it to. It only takes the absolute essential data so it can reconstruct it. All the data, you know, humans need it to identify it, but if you look at the image on the right as a human being, you can still say that's an X but it's not the exact same X as the one on the left. You can still say, okay, that's, you know, that's an X. That's what the computer is doing. It's basically taking only the essential information out of it, downsampling, kicking it out, and then just keeps doing that layer through layer. It does it by identifying key features, right? We identified the center, the left, um, and then it says, okay, well, if I take this and I move it over here, it'll take up less space, less processing power, but it'll still give me the same result. And we can tell how it does it. All right, so these are a series of faces. Um, early networks were really trained on identifying particular points in the face. It's like they were trained identifying the nose, the mouth. You know, you had images of like top face, left face, right face, half the face, no face. Um, so they could really learn what was going on. And you can think of deep learning as applying, um, with supervised learning, you have learning where I tell the computer, this is what this is. So I'll tell the computer, hey, um, this is a nose, this is a face, this is a mouth, this is an air, this is hair. With unsupervised learning, which is what deep neural networks are, you're telling the computer, analyze the image and figure out the underlying mathematical structure. So it doesn't really know that um, nose is a nose, what it knows, what it knows, <laughs> what it knows is that a nose has a certain ratio. All noses, yeah, I'm just making it up, but let's say all noses have a ratio of, you know, one inch of height equals two inch of width. So it knows when it come across another image, hey, this image has the same underlying mathematical structure as this image I was trained on, so it must be the same image. You know, it, it, it senses that underlying mathematical structure, but it doesn't actually know what it is until you tell it. It just knows that it's the same or similar or, or grouped together. Uh, some other fancy graphics. We're not going to talk about it. We're going to kind of like 
move on to the fun stuff. But it just shows the process of how you look, you scan, you downsample, you figure out the important things, you minimize the data, and then you try to come up with an answer at the end. Okay, so we're going to build our first neural network. Uh, this neural network is going to be a calculator. It's going to take two numbers, it's going to add them up, and it's going to give us a result. The first thing here we do is just build a model. You see a lot of the variables here is test model. We're defining how many layers we want the neural network to have. We're defining what kind of activation function. We have a couple of different choices, but we're defining what the activation function is, and we're passing that in. We're asking what kind of metrics we want. We want mean squared error. We want accuracy. We're defining what kind of optimizer we want. Uh, model summary, we're just taking a look at the model that we've created to make sure it matches what we wanted it to do. Now we're going to generate, randomly generate some data. So you see we imported random and we did a quick uh, function. You did a quick little function here where it kind of like does a calculator and it says, okay, it, it trains it in a bunch of additions. Now, actually this is purely because I have to put it in here to make the entire thing work, but it, this is just like some constant we identify as to like where the models are going to be stored and files are going to be stored. Uh, this is a quick, right here, this is a quick, let's run it and see. Oh, okay, so it's going to ask us, so we've, we've got the model, we've trained the model with fake random data to do to learn addition. We haven't actually done addition, we've taught it addition. Now we're going to add two numbers and see what the model comes up with. Okay, let's do um, first number is five, second number is five. What is five plus five? Olivia. <laughs> okay, thank you. So my daughter knows what five plus five is. Let's see if this model knows what five plus five is. Well, it says 10, but it's like 10.0, you know, so you get the idea. It's going to be, it's going to be there, but it's not, you know, it's not completely accurate because once again, the law of large numbers, we had a small training set, you know, we didn't really give it a lot of time to learn, but it, it pretty much got us the answer. Training set like two and five is seven. Yeah. And one and four is five. Yeah. And then it figured out to do five plus five. Exactly. That's good stuff. Yeah. So let's do a let's do another number, right? Yeah. Let's do another number. Let's do um, ten. Uh, I don't know. Give me just throw a number out. Anybody? Forty-two. I'm going forty-two. First number, 42. Second number, 506. 506. All right, let's see if it figures it out. Oh, there you go. Almost, right? Because once again, it's a neural network. It's not actually doing addition. It's looking at the data we fed it. It's really not. Not doing real addition. Exactly. Probability. Figured out where those things are supposed to meet. Exactly. Exactly, right? So that's why we have such a long string. But it's it's accurate, but it's not precise, right? We could still work with it, but it's not gonna, it's not, you know, one plus one equals two kind of thing. Um, okay, now we're gonna get into the more actual facial recognition part. Now that we see, we basically trained a deep neural network to do addition, right? Easy enough. Now we're gonna get into the open CD, <clears throat> open source, actually, um, learn how to do this video recognition and made a demo gods be kind to me <laughs> and made my webcam work. That was the biggest hassle of this whole thing is like figuring out that my webcam actually did not have the driver, so I had to go find the driver, <laughs> this whole thing. Yeah, because I never use this webcam. So, was, yeah. so first thing I want to highlight is um, if you read the code, it says that it's a, we're creating a function to define uh, BGR to RBG, and you're like, what is BGR, what is RBG? BGR is the way that computers represent pictures. It is blue, green, red. The typical picture you get on your phone is always gonna be in a blue, green, red type column format or ratio. <coughs> For OpenCV, it doesn't use that. It uses a red, green, blue format. So we have to do apply a transformation to take whatever image we give it and just convert it to that format. It'll still display as normal, but we have to do it, otherwise we get a really funky looking image, which we'll see here in a minute. Uh, next up, 
So I'm just going to run each cell just to make sure it's working. And then we just do some basic show images because once again, the RDG value is different than what Jupyter would normally have it in. So we have to write our own show image function so it displays properly. Plot image, so we can plot the image, um, do plots. Uh, webcam capture, so we can capture video. Oh, there we go. Why do I look so handsome? <laughs> <laughs> Um, reading from video webcam, let's, let's try that out. Okay, it's, okay, it's working. And this is just like a basic function to kind of clean up the, the windows because this thing generates a lot of windows. All right, and we're going to test out a quick function on how to enter, um, make sure we can get our keystrokes in, right? So we're, it, this is going to give a number value for each keystroke. Let's see. All right, perfect. Now to escape, we hit escape, and escape is equal to 27. So we got that working. All right, so we're going to cover what computers see. Uh, we talked about it earlier. Computers don't actually see pictures. What they do see is number array of red, blue, green, or blue, green elements. So what it's basically saying is that red, blue, green in this array is equal to this brightness. By having a combination of those colors, in different brightnesses, we are then able to represent uh, multiple colors. It's like a rainbow. You know, you combine different colors in a rainbow or rainbow spectrum, and you get a whole new different color. That's what your television is effectively doing. Uh, if you look at this picture, um, I created a picture of the early picture from earlier, and this is how a computer would represent that image in a matrix-like, uh, multi-dimensional array with RBG values of brightness. And this is what the picture would look like, right? This is the matrix for the picture. This is the picture. Now, let's say, and then, and then right here, I'm going to comment out this line. Let's say we didn't apply this transformation to the picture and we just gave OpenCV the picture like we have it. What would it look like? We still get our, our array of brightnesses, but now we get this funky looking thing, <laughs> right? So that's why we have to apply that transformation so that we can get the actual photo in the way that we need it to work. Uh, and then we talked about, uh, you brought up the quality of the camera and the quality of the picture. That doesn't matter to a certain level. So, and these are the different transformations that make it possible. So blurring, blurring, uh, if you have a super accurate picture on the data file, the picture is represented with a lot of spiky points. So it has a lot of outliers that you know give it really fine accuracy, but at the same time make it very hard for the computer to analyze because there's a lot of outlying data. So the blur function makes it blurry. It takes all of those sharp edges and downsamples it and makes it more normal, or at least just not as sharp. Uh, oh, and my daughter had a great one, really great one for this. So this picture here is me on LinkedIn or any to your favorite social media platform. That's me on LinkedIn. And then this is me in real life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the same exact image, but it's just a different transformation applied. The dilation is a transformation that picks the maximum value from that pixel, from that group, and then keeps it. Uh, the erosion function does the exact opposite. We pick the minimum value from that pixel and we keep it. So that's why they look, you know, this is actually being in real life as well, too. You know, put it out there. Um, candy edge detector. So if you look at this picture on the top and the, and the thing on the bottom, you can see that it's not the picture, but it's the outline of the picture, right? So that's how the computer is able to tell the shape how we really get the shapes. So we don't, once again, the picture, the computer doesn't look at the entire picture, it downsamples it to the level it needs because all of that data is not, I don't need to know that the tree is green to figure out your face, like, it means nothing to the computer. Uh, thresholding. Thresholding is a kind of binary way of assigning, uh, within grayscale, a maximum and minimum value. So if you look at it, once again, it's the exact same picture. But what we've done is we've assigned, say, okay, only return pixels 
of more than this value. Only return pixels, or if it's not more than this value, it's black. If it's, you know, so if you look at it, the picture really tells you that the 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 latter parts of your face are gonna show up. So uh, coated is white. So you have your forehead, you have your cheeks, you have your kind of like the part that faces the sun really bright. But if you look at your neck, that has a shadow, right? So that's gonna be black. So it, it assigns that kind of binary classification to it where like maximum value, you know, anything above this, give it a white, anything below it, give it a black. And kind of still retains the picture, but without all of the blue greens and everything else. Won't that eventually be a feature now of your algorithm? Yes. Your threshold? Yep. All of these different things, the blurring, all of them are gonna get used in the algorithm to help us do motion tracking and if it works, we'll see. Um, so, so this right here, if we look at it, is we're gonna, so this is a picture I have stored on, um, images, yeah, so where is this thing? This is image folder, BG, BGB. So this is the background. What else? What are the what are the files that I have in it? Current frame. Okay. And then this is this a new picture with the Gatorade bottle, right? So we ran a series of transformations on it where we can it can be used with video or images, but just think of a video as freeze frame images repeated really fast. So the computer's not looking at a stream of data so much as it's sampling that video at different points and then analyzing that. So you have the original picture, you have your Gatorade bottle, and then the computer saying, oh, what is the difference? How does it figure out the difference? Because it does two things. It takes that original image, because it's, we know it's a numerical um, array, it has all the numbers for it, and then it overlays it with the new picture, with a new numerical array, and says, what is the difference? So think of it this way, you have an array with uh, three ones, one, one, one. Then you introduce a new, you overlay a new array with one, zero, one. When the computer looks at it, it says, oh, that zero and the one in the middle, that's the difference. So that's how it does the picture. It doesn't actually look at the picture, it looks at your RGB values in your array and looks at the difference. In a Video, it uses like a mean average. In a picture, it just uses the actual number itself. So then it's able to say, okay, boom, there we go. We know that in the first picture, everything is gonna be black because all the values are the same. In the second picture, um, once you overlay it, there's a clear difference, right? Because the green Gatorade bottle, the hand, those are all different values. So then all it simply does is everything is black, but these values that we're gonna show you. Then you're doing kind of like similar thing, thresholding, blurring, reducing, uh, grayscale, to just put it in grayscale. Now, think of the same array, right? That one, one, and one, <clears throat> that one, zero, one. What you're gonna see now is you're basically gonna cut out the ones on the side, and you're gonna leave just the, the zero and one in the middle, if that made any sense. Um, yeah, there we go. So now it's looking at it and it's saying, okay, well, the background image is gonna be all in black because that's all the same, but we're gonna outline the shape of the Gatorade bottle, right? So we use the same thing, kind of like thresholding to show the difference. Now we can see, oh, okay, that's an outline of a hand in a bottle. Uh, what's that? Is that similar to like structural similarity? In the I, First of all, I'm not gonna, I don't know everything, and I'm gonna say I don't know what a structural similarity index is. So please enlighten me, because I right, wanna know. It's, uh, the way I understand it, so uh -huh. let's start with that. Um, it is a quality metric between two image, images based on similar taking the, the array of those images and then compare them. I don't know the example. Yeah, and, well from yeah. that description, yeah, it would be, yeah, it would be, this, it would be similar if not the same. Um, so now we're going to try to do this kind of same thing with some video, if my, oh yeah, so if you see on the video, 
So this is like a, a frame. It's not, once again, this is open CD, this is open source, so it's not gonna be perfect, but for some you know, open source picked together stuff, it gives us a pretty good idea of how it would work you on live video. You don't move it, it disappears, because it becomes the background. If, yeah, if it stays there, so what the, what, it depends on how, and this is where like, um, really working the program comes in, because what it is, it, it, the, the way I wrote it, it takes one initial frame at the beginning, and it's saved that as like, this is like the master copy, and then everything else is just compared to that. So if I wanted to, I could rewrite it to like, update that master copy over time. You know, so, that theory bubble just disappeared because it stayed still. Yeah. That means that the background was something recent. Yeah, exactly. So not, it's re not something yeah. at the beginning. I like the idea of having it at the beginning, though. Exactly. So it's recent. Yeah, yeah this, in this. It became its own background. Exactly. In this instance, it became its own background because the computer's re. re you know, re exactly. Recomparing. So, yeah, every 10 seconds, every 30 seconds, it's taking. Exactly. Exactly, it's taking a new frame of the background and comparing that. So if you don't move the object, then yes, it would just, that would just become the entire background. Um, there's ways to mitigate that, but yes. So next thing, we're gonna do a quick contour. And this is the one thing I was not able to get 100% working, so we'll see if it actually works, where part of motion tracking is being able to outline things and say, isolate images. So what this little program does right here, so if you look at right here, it says define blue, green, red. So this is why we're able to see blue. Really, if we assigned, if we found the RBG values for red or yellow or whatever it is, we could technically have any color in that just chose blue. Um, so by picking a color, we're telling uh, OpenCV, hey, find this color and outline it. So let's see. This might crash my computer. I don't know. It's blue, blue cam. No, not really. I guess it's not blue enough. It's doing something though. It's, I mean, you can kind of, if you look closely, you can kind of see it. It's activating on something. It's activating on something, just not my blue cozy, which I thought was going to kill it. It's kind of like the edge between blue and anything non blue. It's yeah. Like or something. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know, maybe because I'm wearing like a blue shirt. Maybe that. Oh, well, that kind of worked a little bit better. So if you look at it, you can, yeah, it's not great, but then again, this is something I threw together in a week. But you can kind of tell that it's, okay, it's recognizing the blue outline. It's, you know, doing something with the blue. Is the screen painting for the projector? No, it's not the projector because it's not showing up on my screen either. Oh, well, that's a little bit better. Nice edges. Yeah, it's like, it's, you know what it is? It likes sharp edges. Anybody have? Something with a really sharp edge that's blue. No. Oh, let's do the water bottle. I don't know. I'm gonna. These are good. Let me see. Maybe this has like a little blue dot on there. Maybe. Where? No, I need. I think I just needed like a sharp edge. <laughs> oh yeah. Let's try that. Let's try the. Let's try the blue, blue business card. card. Blue business card. Let's try. It. Let's. Let's see if any of this. Oreos. Yeah, Oreos. Oreos. Oh, oh, oh. I think you have to three. <laughs> three. Oh, well, that. Oh, yeah, 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 you can see it. There we go. You see Slate? Yeah, we can see Slate. Right? It's blue against a white edge. Yeah, I think that's what it is. So, but once again, that's where more advanced programming skills will come in handy. You can actually tweak it to make it work better. Um, so, next thing we're going to do is. We're going to apply a neural network to do gesture recognition. And keep in mind, actually, this thing is going to horribly fail because um, when I, I, long story short, the picture of what should be my fist is actually my face. Oh. So <laughs> when you see 100% for fist, it's going to be my face. But then again, I've trained it on my face. You know, Nobody punched me. One why it might not found the flu, all these things are printed. Uh, the print itself has is, dot of blue. Yeah. Not absolute blue. Not absolute blue. That's why he's probably using a bottle cap because it's like a solid object and not, you know. Mm, okay. So once again, right, it's, sometimes it's object selection and different things. Crash. That's a success. Hey, I'm claiming it. 
Um, so this allows us to do gesture recognition by combining all those different techniques we can see here that is doing a threshold, is doing, it's figuring out the foreground, is figuring out the background. Um, it's doing a lot of different things and all of this from, and we can tell, so remember the, what is it, the Gatorade bottle example earlier? You know, it's still showing as like, because when it took that original image, it's showing that, hey, you're somewhere else now. Now I'm back to being me. But this is cool visual effects though, I guess. <laughs> is this being parallel processing? No, this is not. This is all done on CPU, which is probably why it's not kind of working the best. Or oh, it could just be my coding skills. I'm just going to be honest with that one. Uh, but it gives us an idea, right? So now we're going to briefly talk about how the computers actually track me. Not in track in the sense of tracking across the internet, but tracking in the sense of like, how does it know that within the image it's moving? So what you have to think about it is that, one, it assigns, it picks a, I think, that's what I think it picks a cluster, right? It picks a point on the screen within given, you could fix, have a fixed point, it could be, you know, however you decide. It gets a point on the screen, and remember that histogram from earlier? It takes that histogram, it finds a mean average of all those pixels, and it says, this is, this is center. Now, as the object within the screen moves, those values also shift. And when it gets outside of your set tolerance for what the mean is, because remember, it's all numbers, so we created a mean standard. Now, there's a different mean over here. That focal point then changes to match that new mean. So all it is is taking the underlying data, it's computing a histogram, finding a mean, and then every time the image moves, it's calculating a new mean and it's saying, is this outside of the established mean that I have? And then it's reframing your bounding box to that new mean. So, yeah, so that's one way of doing it. Um, and we'll show a quick video. I have a video file on here. Let's see if I can find it. It's, I don't know, I think it's this one. I'm not sure. This one, not gonna work. Maybe it's this one? That's not gonna work either. It's very slow in there. No, 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 I saved all this stuff to my, um... <coughs> oh, here it is. I saved it all to my computer because maybe this will not work. Okay, so this is the raw image, right? This is like a car moving and you can tell I'm not like, it's not something I had pre-baked in. This is like the raw image it's working with to track it. And it's not going to do that great of a job, but it, you will get the idea of it. Um, so we're going to take this image right up here. We highlighted it, right? We captured our image within our images folder. And now let's see if it can find it. So it's established a bounding box. It's searching, it's searching, it's not really finding any movement. Oh, it found some movement. Now it is tracking the object within the screen, right? Okay, tracking, tracking, and okay, now there's no object, so it's searching, it's searching, it's searching, it's searching, it's, oh, new object, and now it's moving it, right? But because of our bounding box and everything, it's kind of big, so, you know, it's not exactly accurate. It's not 100%, but we can tailor it with code to get more accuracy. Well, it's not specific to an object type. It's just picking up something that's moving that's the same shape. No, no, not even the same shape. No. It's picking up moving. Movement of, but it's, a, it's got to track the, 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 the history of the distribution. Yeah. It's moving. It's exactly, it's but think about it this way. Like, so the bridge, the sky, those are not moving. Those are stationary right. objects. Like only trucks or exactly. People. Exactly. It could pick up a person if I set it over there. It would track that person because within the frame, those histogram means are gonna move over time, so it'll just track. It'll track it, but it doesn't know it's this. This basic implementation doesn't know that it's a person. Right, right. It just knows it's a, a series of means why, why that. Why hanging out there by the pole? Uh, because when I initially built it, I couldn't really find a way to assign it. It's like um, for k-means clustering, you have to assign it to a point, and I couldn't really find a way to assign it to a point that was already moving. Random, just to talk. Yeah, okay. so, you know, but it's something we can work on. Um, so that's one of it. 
But you can tell the basic implementation is kind of like, if there's no object in there moving, then it's hard to find it. Another way of doing it is called cam shift, where you start with a mean shift, where you, same thing, you identify the mean, you track the mean over time, uh, but this one includes image orientation uh, into the mix so you can then orient your size of the box based on the image. So if your moving object is big, it will, re it will reorient the box to be bigger and track a bigger object. For this one, it's, <clears throat> you'll see. This is going to be great. <laughs> yeah, because when I, once again, once I coded it, you know, working on it, trying to get it to work, the only way I was really able to get it to work was like by making, making the box big enough where it would, I tried to fix the first problem, but then by fixing the first problem, I, I assigned it to a point where it had so many moving parts that it was the box resized to basically come across the whole screen because if you look at if you look at the box, it's doing what it's supposed to do. Kind of fading, coming your way. Exactly, it's all tracking the, all of the moving objects. Moving. But guess what? Every object is moving, so the box is almost the size of the screen because you have a whole bunch of moving objects. You just limit the, X, the width and height. Yeah, you could exactly like limit it. You know, so there's different tweaks you can do to make it work better. You have multiple boxes, one for each moving thing. There you go. You could. Yes, you can. That's all I will say about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> um, so, and then, so this is where I will ask to ask for some feedback. Please go review the code, do a, a pull request, do something. Yeah, go build something with it. Um, this was when I tried to do like the fist. So this was going to collect data and then a series of pictures. I couldn't get the code to work. It says, you know, so if you, when you go online, if you find a way to make it work, please do a pull request on my GitHub and Let's, you know, let's get it to work. So, because I couldn't get it to work, I basically took a picture of my face and, you know, yeah, made my face a fist. Um, so, same thing like we did before with the calculator, we're going to go in and we're going to build a neural network, right? It's not going to be trained on anything, we're just kind of outlining the framework of it, saying the structure of it. Uh, I need to update some packages, I guess. We're going to prepare our training data. Grayscale, okay, let's see. Image data generator is not defined. I don't know, let's see. Oh, it's working. So, it found the one image which we know is going to be my face because, let's go back to, let's go back here and write in here T data and V data. T data is test data, data is gonna to use to test and the V data is gonna be validation data. Um, data it's it's the same data, but okay. So this is the image that's in that folder, right? Same image from before. We're going to okay. So it found the image. It's going okay. We're going to we're going to do stuff. Let's see. Works okay. It works. We're going to train our model. Get some feedback from it. Um, so what it did, and we'll go in and we'll explain this number. So the plotting history is gonna give us more information about the actual model itself. So in the statistical description of the model, we have loss and accuracy, right? Loss and accuracy always equal one. So the greater the loss, the less the accuracy. The greater the accuracy, the less the loss. It's just a way of saying how good was your model. That's for the training set. This is for the validation set. And then now we, completed the demo. Let's see if it works. Oh, a bunch of stuff. Okay, so it has a bunch of like, you can tell all the different transformations that apply to it, but let's look at two things. We're gonna look at our, on the, yeah, okay, so on that image that's moving or whatever, you have a live image like real time, it's not something we did, and then on the right side, you have basically the output of what the computer thinks it is. So what should happen is that when I put my face in front of it, it should read like a 90% fist. Let's see. Now. What's a file? Yeah, what's a file? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. There we go. What's happening here? Oh, 98%, 99% fist. 
right? Okay. Yeah, exactly. I labeled it wrong, but you get the idea. And the data, once again, is only as good as the label. So because I labeled this as a fist, it said it's a fist. It does. It's constantly sampling within that box. Exactly. Running it through the algorithm, making the prediction, and giving you a confidence that it's one of those things. Exactly. And we could have different label images in there. I could have a fist or point swing, all kinds of different things. Let's put a can. Oh. The can is 36% that it's a face or a fist. <laughs> so, you know, it's like that. Looks very similar. And the value and the hot dog. Yeah, exactly. Oh, <laughs> that would have been so epic. Oh, yeah. Yes. You're right. I should have a hot dog. No, I should like a hot dog, no hot dog. That would have been good. <laughs> 20 years to do this. 20, exactly. Only 20 years to, you know, hot dog, no hot dog. Oh, that's, that's good. Um... Okay, so I'm not gonna walk through all of this code, but, and we're gonna close out with some other advanced implementation. YOLO, you, look, you only look once. This is, applies the same basic techniques we talked about, but what it does, it applies it over the picture multiple times. So it does a 13 by 13 cell of a picture, and it says within that picture, it assigns everything a probability that it is something. So each of these pic each of these cells within that picture will get a probability. What is the probability that that tiny cell is a dog? What is the probability it's a bite? It'll then take all of those probabilities and aggregate them up as it goes along. So maybe three out of five cells say it's a dog. And guess what? That becomes a dog. Maybe two out of, you know, seven out of eight cells say it's a bite. So then that object becomes a bite. So it, breaks it down, multiple, you know, smaller images, scans it, assigns a probability, then combines those probabilities and gives you a prediction of what it is. And you'll see here in a second. You still have to train it though, right? You still have to train it. You still have to tell it what stuff uh, is to a certain does level. Does the training take a dog and break it up into little pieces? Yeah. It does the same thing. It's a convolution network. It scans the individual. Oh, yeah, it goes across all of them, assigns a probability. So this is what it does, right? It, it starts with this. It breaks it into you know different chunks, assigns a probability, adds up those probabilities that are the highest. So if you know if it's a 90% chance it's a dog, and then this one says it's a 100% chance it's a cat, it's going to go if the 100% chance it's a cat, and that box is going to become a cat, and it's going to keep doing that up all the way up the chain, right? And then we can see that it's kind of starting to coalesce around three main things, right? It said, okay, these three things are something. But they're not hot dogs. But they're not hot dogs. <laughs> this is true. And because of the training we've given it, you can tell that, okay, these, we have a car, we have a bicycle, we have a dog. And that's a combination of different techniques, but all of them, the basic stuff we implemented on the computer, just all put together at a very kind of like advanced level, very fast along with labels, because guess what? The computer doesn't really know it's a dog. Like, it doesn't know what a dog is. It's because we established a neural network, we gave it some kind of image of a dog and said, this is a dog. It developed the underlying structure of that dog, and then across each individual frame, it mathematically assigned a probability that that's a dog, it's a cat, it's a car, and then it added up all those probabilities, drew a bounding box, and said, within this bounding box, I'm 90% sure it is a dog. If you've ever done a CAPTCHA where it had uh, signs on the road and yeah. cars, you are training, you are helping Google train, train the a machine model. model. It's 100% true. Um, how, uh, in this mentality, how do you know that there's a space that they take up? Good question. So it part of it depends on a couple of things, um, and this is where the more software engineering part of it would come in, which means that you have to determine what level of clarity on the image do you need to run the algorithm at the level of accuracy that you need. So if I have an image that is you know five megabytes. Do I need all five megabytes to get a 90% accuracy or 80% accuracy? Maybe I can use those techniques and downsample it to one megabyte and still get the same level of accuracy that I need. So, and it really you're not, it depends, it just depends on how you kind of work it. Another important point though is that's only during training. Yeah, that's only during training. Once you train the model, 
All you really have is a coefficient. Exactly. You have a coefficient, so you're not storing the image within the model. You're storing a mathematical representation of the probability distribution or coefficient of that image. No, but you still have to have the underlying structure to understand what the coefficient means. No. It's all safe. Yeah, it's all saved, so it's nothing more than, you know, probably some, you know, floats. Uh, that's really it. I mean, it's just a, a series of numbers, of integers assigned, you know, to a structure. Well, um, if you're, like, doing security at a stadium, yeah. you're going to have to do a lot of crunching. Okay, so I, okay. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So that's where the software engineering and the more uh, turning this into a production model would come, and that's what... When we talk about stuff like that, Amazon has done. Um, I love this meme, by the way, YOLO, say one more time. <laughs> uh, but so Amazon recognition, so the things you're talking about, Amazon recognition, Azure, Google, they all have computer vision software that do a version of it. Um, and those are all API driven. So basically you use an API to send it an image, it analyzes it, and it sends you back a response in JSON, a string in JSON saying, this, this, and this. Um, but when you're talking about like the, the amount of images, yeah. really, I, I guess the easy. It, yeah. The way you say it, it's still going to be a lot of numbers to crunch. Yes. And that's where I talked about CUDA and different things come in. So there's different ways, and I, I can't really get into all of them now, but there's different ways that when, as you're feeding the data in to downsample it, and then also the computation part of it. So if you think of it like an array, right, like the, uh, a numbered array, you, uh, the way a CPU does it is that it's serial process. It's I do this, then I do this, then I do this, then I do that, then I do this. With a GPU, by using the GPU, you can run all those things in parallel. So that way the computational load um, is lessened because you're not, exactly, it's distributed across multiple processors so you get the results back quicker and because this is really all math at the end of the day you're really just doing a, a, a bunch of mathematical operations so those can be time, yeah and that's really the advance in data science has come from because we were able to combine large amounts of data with large amounts of processing capability and also efficient algorithms to make it all work together I mean, you could have probably done this stuff 30 years ago but it would have taken you forever because the computational um, power wasn't there to do it in real time. We had the algorithms, we had the basic knowledge, but we didn't have the processing power to do it. Is this why weather prediction is getting incrementally better? Yes, because we have more computational power, we can handle more data, we can process more data, um, and, and the data set's also richer. So maybe back in the day we could only really collect because we could only store one gigabyte of data, but now we can collect and store one terabyte of data. And it goes back to what I said before, right? More data is always better. There's also innovation. There's also yeah, innovation, algorithms. Uh, yeah. Like 10 years ago, like Photoshop, you could set up 100 Photoshops and have it as a farm. Yeah. And, and if someone needed to do something really quick, like, like a TV <clears throat> network needed to have a video compiled really quick, yeah. they use let's say, 100 computers, and then, boom, they got it real quick. Exactly. On air. Yeah, now, now I can now use my CPUs. Are getting yeah. We don't need that same technology. Exactly. So just to kind of wrap it up, um, anybody seen Minority Report? I don't have to play this whole clip. Anybody seen Minority, you know, Tom Cruise? Yeah. So that's kind of what the future, everybody thinks the future of AI is. But the key thing I think, I hope we all learned in here, is that he was using his eye, like, uh, retina scan as a means of identification but really we don't need to you know so there's you know a lot of like big brother stuff in here but I think there's also I think that's all I really say okay so but there's also and in conclusion when we talk about it we have to ask ourselves what kind of future do we want to create is it going to be like a dystopian future where we are you know, surveillance state, Big Brother's watching us all the time, every movement is monitored. Is it going to be where our face becomes our passport? We don't really have to, you know, do anything. We just kind of walk into the airport and walk through security because they already know who we are. 
Um, or is it going to be like new levels of personalization? I was thinking about this while I was on the way here because I drive a really old car. I'm like, how cool would it be if I had a brand new car that had a bunch of cameras around it where I don't even need a key anymore? I just walk up to the car, the camera scans my face, and it knows who I am. It knows that, oh, this is my owner. It opens the door. I hit start, and that's it. I don't have to, I don't have to use a key. I don't have to use an app. I don't have to do anything. 